Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar on conducting sample size reassessment with time to event endpoints. I would now like to introduce Pantelis Vlahos, Principal Strategic Consultant at Cytel. Thank you, Lisa. And uh, once again, thank you everybody for attending this webinar. This is the next to last in our series of East Orientation webinars. Uh, and today we're going to be covering um, time to event as um, endpoints and how to conduct uh, a study with a sample size uh, reassessment. So let me go into the presentation mode. The, the format is going to be pretty much the same as in the previous um, um, webinars. Uh, we, I'm going to be covering a little bit of the methodology of uh, uh, sample size reassessment with an emphasis for time to event endpoints. Then we're gonna dig in into a case study where we're gonna see how we're gonna be able to run such a design um, within the realms of East. And we're going to break four questions uh, and a conclusion. So once again, um, this is the fourth out of a series of five webinars. So far we have covered uh, base, escalate, MCP mod, uh, and uh, the MAMS. Uh, multiple arms, multiple stages uh, uh, module. And today we're going to be focusing on the survival module and the serve adapt module. Um, actually, we're going to be spending more time on the serve adapt, but by ways of doing that, we're also going to revisit some of the points of the survival module. Uh, I would like to remind you that uh, there was an extensive webinar uh, on uh, the details of the survival module um, performed in uh, late. January, which was also recorded, uh, and through that, in, in that uh, webinar, we went through the design of time to event studies, uh, group sequential uh, mostly, and we saw how we can also predict the course of events in that study and how to use some of the latest features uh, of the software, which was to run an interim analysis using a surrogate endpoint, something other than, for example, overall uh, survival. So these points have already been covered on, on the survival webinar that we did back in January. Today, we're going to be focusing a little bit more on the sample size uh, re-estimation part. Um, a little flash screen about the survival module, which essentially uh, facilitates the use of group sequential designs, uh, as well as the interim monitoring of such designs. And as I mentioned, uh, in the new version of EAST, we have added the capability to perform go-no-go -no -go decisions at an interim with a surrogate endpoint, which is highly correlated uh, with uh, your final endpoint analysis. But the emphasis today is going to be on the serve adapt part, uh, where we're going to be seeing different rules for increasing the sample size, and in this case, the event uh, size um, of the study, uh, without inflating um, type 1 error. Um, so, I will start uh, the methodology part by sort of like mentioning that um, this area of uh, designs falls into the confirmatory adaptive uh, type of designs. And typically with these type of designs, the regulators are going to come back to you with uh, several concerns um, which have to do with how you maintain type 1 error. And I'm hoping that we're going to be addressing some of that today. Uh, but uh, there are also non-statistical issues on how you maintain operational bias, which is not the topic of today's uh, um, uh, presentation. But uh, we, uh, we will be presenting uh, some of that part in the new series of webinars, which is going to be uh, following this one on complex innovative designs. So there you're going to be able to get uh, a better feel on, on some of the regulatory uh, aspects uh, of these types of designs. So we are all aware of the traditional types of designs where we fix the total sample size in advance and we monitor the accruing data for safety only. And there is only one final efficacy analysis uh, in the end, uh, which may pose some risks, especially if you have a treatment which uh, may not be as efficacious as you think, sometimes may even be harmful, or if sometimes you have a treatment which is um, very efficacious and you have a population like a, a, in a rare disease where you might want 
to terminate the study as early as possible uh, and switch people onto that drug. Um, you're not able to do that with a traditional design, but with an adaptive design, you are able because you are monitoring the accruing data both for efficacy and safety, and you have possibilities for altering the future course of the study. Um, these alterations, of course, have to be uh, pre-specified. Uh, and you do that through the utilization of unblinded data. So this also uh, says that there's going to be a, the use of a data monitoring committee. Uh, now, the types of changes that you can do at the interim have to do with either stopping early due to overwhelming efficacy or futility or harm. So this is just the group sequential designs that we are all familiar with. But you can also do other types of corrections. You may increase the sample size um, after an unblinded look at the data, which is the topic of today's um, uh, webinar. You may drop ineffective doses in multi-arm trials. This is something that we saw on the very first webinar uh, on MAMS. Uh, you may have a biomarker-based population enrichment, so focus the remaining part of the study on a subpopulation, which is what we're going to be seeing next week. Uh, with adaptive uh, population enrichment, uh, or you might switch endpoints from non-inferiority to superiority. So there are different types of changes that you can perform. And as I mentioned, today our focus is going to be on unblinded sample size re-estimation. Now, what is the motivation for that? Typically, we do not know what the effect size is, and most of the time we also do not know what the, the variability uh, is so that we can power the study uh, properly. Uh, this may be due to the fact that we might have limited um, prior experience due to small pilot studies. Um, you might have an improved standard of care with dilutes of treatment effect. Uh, and um, basically, you have an unknown delta and an unknown sigma, a known treatment effect and an unknown uh, standard deviation. If only the standard deviation is unknown, unknown then you can uh, get by by performing a blinded sample size reassessment, which is done without having to unblind the data and taking a, getting an idea of the overall variability of um, your um, study population at some uh, interim point, and then readjusting appropriately your sample size based on that pooled estimate of the variance. Uh, this. Um, is typically recommended by the FDA, by other regulatory uh, agencies as well, and it typically does not have any impact on your type 1 error. Uh, there may be a small impact if you are in, a, in, a, in the area of um, equivalence or non-inferiority types of designs. However, uh, if your delta is unknown, then you would need to unblind the data and uh, do your sample size uh, adjustment based on an updated version of that. Now, um, what are sort of like reasons why you might need to do it? I mentioned that already. You might have uh, unreliable pilot studies. Uh, typically, these studies are small studies, and um, there are large treatment effects that emerge uh, from them, which um, as um, samples get uh, accumulated might become smaller and smaller. So what we might want to do is we might want to correct for those unreliable pilot studies. Another reason is that you might have a milestone-driven investment. You might be a part of a smaller biotech, which may not have to the resources to run um, a study for a smaller treatment effect, which might be clinically meaningful because of uh, the expenses and the, number, the sample size or event size that this requires. But you may want to start um, optimistically with a smaller sample size and only commit the additional resources if uh, it is needed. And sometimes this may also trigger an additional investment uh, from uh, the VC. So this is the approach uh, that we're going to be taking as well. And the approach that we are implementing in the software is based on a seminal paper by our co -found, one of our co-founders, Cyrus Meta, along with Stuart Pocock, in the use of the so-called promising zone design. With this type of a design, you would have something that begins just like a regular group sequential design. You have an interim analysis. If you have overwhelming evidence of efficacy or of utility, 
you might stop the study. And if otherwise, you might continue uh, to the next stage. And you can continue to the next stage either by keeping the original sample size um, in place or by increasing the sample size. And you can do that if you fall in what is called, if your results of the interim are fall in what is called the promising zone. This promising zone, this example that I show you here, is something that is being defined by thresholds of conditional power. So there is a lower and upper threshold that is going to be able to define that zone. You might be able to define it also in terms of your test statistic. If you are in an area of time to events, you might use also the estimated hazard ratio to define uh, such, a region, um, such a region. So this is the methodology that we are going to be using uh, for this um, webinar. Now, we're going to see that methodology in action. Uh, we're going to be using a case study from the, the area of metastatic lung cancer. We're going to have a two-arm multicenter study uh, with second-line therapy for metastatic non-small cell lung cancer. Our primary endpoint is going to be overall survival. Our median um, overall survival for the control arm is about eight months. And we want 90% power to detect a hazard ratio of 0.7. So an increase in overall survival of about 3.4 months uh, for the experimental arm. Uh, we're going to be using one-sided alpha test uh, of uh, 0.025 uh, with one interim look. And we will explore also, as I said, an early stopping for ERP efficacy or futility if we have uh, overwhelming evidence of that. Um, we also have an additional piece of information in terms of uh, the accrual duration, which is uh, about 24 months, and we're also going to have an additional 12 months uh, of uh, follow-up. So this is the design that uh, we're going to um, use, and we're going to do that through the premises of EAST. So the, the way that you're going to do this in EAST is if you focus on the time to event, the survival types of designs, which are on the very right part of your uh, toolbar, and the, and over there, you can select either designs which are given um, accrual rates or designs which are given a uh, uh, fixed uh, accrual period, accrual duration, and study duration, which is the case uh, that we have right now. So once you select uh, this particular input, you're going to be faced with an input screen which allows you to specify your type 1 error, which, as I mentioned, is 0.025. You want 90% power. And then you can specify the survival information, either in terms of hazard rates, in terms of median survival times, or in terms of cumulative percent survival. Um, in this case, we had information about median survival times. And as I mentioned, there is eight months for the um, control arm. And for the experimental arm, I can either type in directly 11.4 months, or I can check the hazard ratio button and specify that I want to detect a hazard ratio of 0.7, which will automatically fill in the uh, median OS for my experimental treatment. This is the first tab. Uh, in the accruals and durations, I can specify my accrual duration, which is 24 months, and the study duration, which will include the additional 12 months uh, of follow-up. Let's assume that we have no dropout uh, information at this point. The last thing that we mentioned is that we are also going to be entertaining uh, an interim look. Um, for the moment, we can assume an interim look that takes place halfway through the study. And in that interim look, we may stop the study early for efficacy. Here, we're going to be utilizing, just for illustration, the Lana Demets version of O'Brien and Fleming's efficacy boundaries. While for futility, uh, we, we will be using another type of spending function. Again, just for illustration, I'm going to be using the, the gamma family with a parameter uh, of minus 5. Um, just for your information, this type of parameter also resembles quite a bit uh, the O'Brien and Fleming type of boundaries. So this will allow us to visualize the boundaries. And I can do this by clicking on this boundaries icon. And by default, you will visualize the boundaries in the scale of the Z statistic. What might be more informative is to see what happens if you look at this in the 
hazard ratio scale. So if I go at the interim look, 50% information fraction, you can see that if my hazard ratio is 1.02 or higher, then I am in the futility zone, right? So that constitutes overwhelming evidence of futility. If my hazard ratio is 0.63 or lower, then that constitutes uh, overwhelming evidence for efficacy, and I would stop the study at that time. So if I run this design by computing uh, the characteristics of this design, we will end up seeing the following. Uh, we will see that the design would require a maximum of 333 subjects, uh, which you can see over here. Uh, sorry, 337 events, uh, with a corresponding number of subjects that would need to be recruited in this 24-month uh, period of 423. If the drug works, so under the alternative hypothesis, we would require an average of 279 events, error, and 400 subjects, and an accrual duration of about uh, 22, 23 months, and a study duration of about 30 months. Okay, so this is what the group sequential design is if we were to design the study to detect the hazard ratio of 0.7. However, it turns out that 0.77 is also a cleanly meaningful uh, difference to detect. And if I repeat the exact same procedure, but this time I focus, um, I change, just change the hazard ratio and make that uh, a hazard ratio of 0.77, then I can select the two designs and uh, display them side by side. And you can see that um, having a hazard ratio of 0.77, which would correspond to uh, about a month of difference uh, in the overall survival um, in the experimental arm, I would need uh, almost double the event size. So from 337, I would go to 627. And uh, from the 423 subjects that would need to go up to 771 subjects that would need to be recruited within that period. This is a, an upfront commitment which is impossible uh, for uh, the sponsor um, in question, and that's why uh, they decided to go with a hybrid approach. And that hybrid approach is the approach that I mentioned um, in uh, my original slides. So, we would design optimistically for the smaller uh, treatment effect, or sorry, for the largest treatment effect, which requires a smaller commitment. We will perform the interim analysis halfway through. If we have overwhelming evidence of efficacy, has a ratio less than 0.63, we stop for efficacy. Overwhelming evidence of futility has a ratio greater than 1.2, we stop for futility. Otherwise, we continue the study and we can continue either with the original sample size or by increasing the number of events in sample size if we fall in the promising zone. What is the promising zone in this case? This is something that will be found uh, through trial and error and through experimentation using the simulation capabilities of the software, as we will see. If our conditional power at the interim is between 35 and 90%, then that is the promising zone. This is the area in which we're going to be increasing the resources. Conditional power less than 35% means that the results are not that good, but they're not that bad to warranty stopping for fertility. So we're not going to be changing the design. A conditional power greater than 90% means that the results are pretty good, but they're not that good to warranty stopping for efficacy. We're going to be continuing the design without making any changes. Now, the way that we come up, with these thresholds of 35 and 90 percent, as I said, is something that you do through simulation. And also the increase that you would perform on your sample size or your number of events is also something that you would experiment with through simulation. Within the software, we also provide three different methods that will enable you to make sure that your type one error is being controlled. So in terms of our adaptation principles, we have to keep in mind that our primary driver of the power is the number of events. Based on the FDA guidance, uh, we can only increase the number of events, not decrease them. And we're going to be increasing them by an amount which is needed to achieve some target conditional power subject to a cap. Okay. Um, and then we're going to compute the sample size increase which is necessary to achieve this desired increase in events. 
without undue prolongation of the study. And this is also something that we can examine through the graphic capabilities uh, of the software. There is obviously a complex relationship between the number of events, the increase in the sample size and the study duration. Again, this is something that can be examined through simulation. So let's see that. Let me go back to this design. As I said, we're going to be selecting the optimistic design, the design that require that target hazard ratio of 0.7, and we're going to be selecting the simulate icon just to simulate that design. This will bring us the simulation input screen, which if I make no changes at all and just hit on the simulate button, it will just simulate the design for this number of events with the corresponding sample size uh, and um, targeting a hazard ratio of 0.7 um, under the different stopping criteria that we have selected. So if we repeat the simulation 10,000 times, you would expect in about 9,000 out of those 10,000 times to reject the null hypothesis. So this will get you sort of like an estimated power of 90%, which was uh, also what our original power was like. However, here we're not going to be doing that. We're going to be clicking on the Include Options um, uh, button, and we're going to be selecting the Sample Size Reestimation option. With that Sample Size Reestimation option, we will have a new tab which allows us to choose what sort of method we can use, which will guarantee the maintenance of the type one error, and then what sort of increase we're gonna be performing in the number of events. So here we want to be increasing up to 500 events. So I'm going to be specifying a multiplier of 500 over 337, which is going to give, be giving me a maximum number of events of 500. And I'm gonna be using at least that number, say a roughly 1.5 for the sample size. Then I can go and select what my promising zone will be from 0.35 to 0.9. Uh, this is in the conditional power scale, but however, we, we also provide a calculator which allows you to see what that means in terms of estimated hazard ratio or in terms of your test statistic. So if I wanted, for example, to see what a conditional power of 0.35 means, in the hazard ratio scale, I would recalculate that, and you can see that that is the hazard ratio of 0.83. So things are not that good, hazard ratio 0.83, but they're not that bad either to warranty stopping. Remember, we stop if a hazard ratio is greater than 1.02. On the other hand, if our hazard ratio is 0.9, then, if, sorry, if our conditional power is 0.9, then that would translate to a hazard ratio of 0.73, again, Things are good, but they're not that good that would warrant this stopping for efficacy. You will recall that the hazard ratio of 0.63 would give you stopping for efficacy. So you can see also quickly what the, the thresholds that you have set here in conditional power mean in terms of uh, your hazard ratio. Now, in this case, I would want to detect the hazard ratio of 0.7, but I would be simulating also under hazard ratio of 0.7 which is not truly what I want to do, because if I do this, it will be just like running the regular simulation without making, uh, but it, it, before I would run it without making any sample size increase, and I would expect a power of 90%. Here I run it, and I'm going to be increasing the sample size in the case that I fall between 0.35 and 0.9 in the conditional power scale, which means that I would be expecting the power to be even greater than 90%. What I truly want to see is what happens when the true hazard ratio is 0.77 in this process. So if I enter that in the process and then I hit on my simulate button, then I would get the screen that you would see here, which would summarize in out of the 10,000 replications that I run in how many cases I would end up declaring victory unconditionally. So this is about 71%. So this is my unconditional power. Remember, we were targeting 90%, so we're not doing that great here. However, when um, we fall into the promising zone, and this happens about 33% of the time, out of the 10,000 simulations in 3,260, we fall into the promising zone, the power will get up to 85%. Okay, so this, of course, would mean 
an increase in the number of events by an average of 463, and to the study duration of about 40 uh, months. So this is the, the penalty that we would have to pay for, for that increase in the power. And this increase is only going to be called upon if needed. Okay, If you don't need it, then obviously you're not going to be using this. So going back to the slides, um, just to mention um, the, the screenshots that I, I just went through. This is the how you would summarize the operating characteristics by harvesting uh, the numbers from the table that we just saw in the detailed view. And you can see that in this scenario that I, I just showed you, in the pessimistic scenario, if you are simulating under a hazard ratio of 0.77 to detect the hazard ratio of 0.7, your unconditional power is 71%. In the promising zone, it's going to be 85%, which is better than what your non-adaptive design would give you in that case, which is an overall power of 66%. And of course, it comes uh, at this expense in terms of the sample size and the duration of the study. Um, one thing uh, that I would want to mention as well, going back to the design here, is that uh, if I go back to the input screen, um, you can also play around with different durations of the study. So once again, you, you will target an increase on the number of events, which is about 1.5 times the original number of events. But then you can play around and say, well, I want to see what happens if I increase my sample size at the same time uh, from 1.2 up to 1.8, maybe with a step uh, of 0.1. So this would actually run my simulator uh, several times, six times, in order to see uh, what would be the corresponding um, sample size that I would get for these different multipliers. But at the same time, what would be my um, duration of the study? So these were actually summarized. Uh, the results were summarized uh, in these simulations that are run here, which of course, you can see them as with any simulation side by side in East through uh, the output summary view, um, which might be too much of too many numbers to visualize right now. But one thing that you can also do is you can select the plot of study duration uh, and accrual duration just to see what this will give you in terms of um, if, as you vary the maximum sample size what impact you will have on the study duration. So one thing that you will see here, so we're keeping the number of events increase at 1.5, uh, but we are varying the sample size. And you can see, um, so you have the average study duration, and also in the yellow line, you have the average accrual duration. Obviously, the study duration is going to be um, larger at the point where you're going to be recruiting you're going to be increasing the, the study up to uh, 507 subjects. But uh, as you're, you're increasing um, the, the sample size required for the number of events, you will see that the study duration will decrease. And after a point, and onward, you will see that the study duration is not going to change much, no matter how much uh, you increase your sample size to get to those number of events. So. In this example here, you can see that you will have a study duration of 33.3 um, months for a sample size of 635, about the same months, 33.1 for a sample size of 675, 33 months for a sample size of 719, 33 months for a sample size of 761. So what you would probably want to do here, much like you would do in a principal component analysis when you're visualizing a script plot, is try to identify the, the point on this graph after which it's not going to be worth investing any more subjects in terms of gaining uh, towards your duration of the study. So this is one of the diagnostic plots uh, that you can uh, perform um, up to this point. So um, the last thing that I wanted to mention is that uh, all these, oh, going back here to our input screen, um, all these cells that you see here in the sample size reestimation uh, input screen are pink in nature, which tells you that much like I did here in terms of varying 
the increase in the sample size, you can do this pretty much for the number of events, for the upper limit on your study duration, for your target conditional power, as well as for the limits of your conditional power or estimated hazard ratio in order to define the promising zone. This is how you would actually, what you would have to do in order to get to the optimal design. The design that I just showed you here is a design which is actually a result of many runs of going through an iterative process of trying to identify what would be the optimal thresholds in terms of the conditional power, the optimal increase in the sample size and the number of events that would give me this desired power in the promising zone. So this is something that comes at no expense to you because you're using the computational power of the software. And this is how you would actually go about in practice when you are designing uh, such a study and trying to see what the operating characteristics of the study is. So to close, up, close it off, in this particular case, it was believed that the true hazard ratio was between 0.7 and 0.77. Obviously, we could power the study for the smallest treatment effect of a hazard ratio of 0.77, as we saw earlier, but that requires a pretty big upfront commitment of about uh, 600 plus number of events, more than 750 subjects, which was not something that could be met by the sponsor at that time. So as an alternative, we went with option two, which is to power the study for the larger treatment effect and increase the resources if you fall in the promising zone. So this commitment is only gonna be called for if it's needed. It is better than the non adapted trial at powered at the same hazard ratio, obviously not as powerful as a group sequential trial powered at a hazard ratio of 0.77, but of course it comes with these extra perks in terms of the uh, duration and in terms of the desired power uh, of the study. The methods that have been referenced in this presentation are listed uh, in the reference slide, which you're gonna be receiving as well uh, um, in pa as part of your, um, of, of your webinar recording. And I would be more than happy to entertain and gather any questions that you might have up to this point. Uh, but before that, I would leave, uh, give the, the microphone to Alyssa for a small message before we go on. Thank you, Pantelis. And as a reminder, you can submit your questions to the questions pane in your attendee control panel. But before we move into the Q&A, we want to take a moment to remind you that EAST gives you access to a wide selection of trusted fixed and adaptive trial designs. EAST is used by nearly every major pharmaceutical company and the FDA. With a broad selection of popular designs and in an easy to use format, we can help you quickly create and compare trial designs. Our company also offers a range of services from staff that act as an extension of your team and consulting services for more cutting edge projects to our new real world analytics capabilities. We are here to help support your objectives. Thank you, Alyssa. And we can now enter to uh, the Q&A session um, by gathering any questions that you might have. As of some final remarks, I would mention while we're still gathering questions that the statistical methodology for sample size increase in adaptive designs is now well established. There are both operational and regulatory concerns, uh, which used to be a barrier for the implementation of that studies, but these are concerns are now uh, going away. Um, there need to be, of course, auditable processes for documenting who saw what and when. Uh, in these types of designs, uh, and um, how will the knowledge of the interim decision will affect the investigator behavior? These are all things that deal with the operational bias of it. But gradually, with the uh, advent of the methods, with the advent also of the technology for creation of portals that would control the flow of information, these concerns uh, are being resolved. Um, and finally, um, this, as I mentioned, is the next to last uh, webinar in our series. Uh, next week, we're going to be talking about uh, adaptive population enrichment. Uh, and 
uh, I'll be more than happy to take any questions that you have right now. Thank you, Pantelis. Uh, we have a number of questions that are coming in. So our, our first question is, are these interim efficacy analyses typically blinded or unblinded, which was the case in, in your case study? No, no, these are unblinded analyses. So these will all require the utilization of uh, a data monitoring committee. Because what you want to see is, in order to get an idea about what the treatment effect is, you have to be able to see uh, data from both treatment arms. Thank you. Our next question is, how do we control type 1 error? Uh, well, type 1 error, as I mentioned there, we, we provide three different methods uh, to control that uh, in our software. Um, there is the, the Kuihung and one method, which essentially um, does a reweighting of the incremental test statistics in the two stages. Um, so by pre-specifying those weights, uh, you're able to warranty that your type 1 error is being controlled. Uh, then we provide the second method, which is the Chen de Metz and Lan method, um, which was also refined by Gao and Meta um, a little bit afterwards, which, uh, which would allow you to use just the conventional wall statistic for the final analysis uh, if the interim result was promising, and by promising we mean that the conditional power is greater than uh, 0.5. And finally, there's a third method, which is the Mueller and Schaefer method, uh, which is more flexible than any of the other two methods, uh, because with that, not only you can increase the sample size, but you can change the spending function, you may alter the number and the spacing of future interim looks, and the only requirement that it has is that uh, you need to preserve the conditional type on error, which is computed at the time of the design modification. Um, so we provide these three methods. Of course, we are all doing, we're doing this through simulation. So in the latest, um, um, uh, revision of the draft guidance of the FDA for um, adaptive designs. It was mentioned that you could also, well, up until now, you could use, of course, simulations to estimate your power, the power of the study, but now you can also use simulations to uh, estimate and verify your type 1 error. So all you would have to do in this case is to simulate under the null hypothesis. Uh, when you simulate, you're going to be, again, gathering up information on how many times you're going to be winning, you're going to be rejecting the null hypothesis, which if you simulate under the null, this will correspond to in how many cases you're making a type 1 error. So you'll be able to also, uh, through a Monte Carlo approach with a simulation-based approach, to get an estimate about what the type 1 error is going to be. Thank you, Pantelis. Uh, we have another question here. Um, do you have a good example using this for a binary endpoint? Uh, yes, we have used it uh, for a binary endpoint as well, also for a normal type of endpoint. Uh, currently in software, we have capabilities uh, for all of these three types of endpoints to use it. And in all these three cases, you have all three uh, adaptation methods uh, available. So um, we have used it in the past um, with uh, a cardiovascular type um, in a cardiovascular trial with a um, composite endpoint. Uh, and um, we have had, in terms of um, a consulting group, nothing but success in terms of getting the, the design being accepted uh, by the regulators and the study starting. And another question here. How is EAST's implementation of the three methods for type 1 error control documented? And how can we access that documentation? Oh, okay. So, so well, the, the, the one thing that um, you're getting with the software, and this is, um, bear with me, I'll have to just show you again the, um, the software screen, is that in the home tab, you have um, the copy of the user manual. So this is uh, a more than 3,000 page PDF document, uh, which you can see up here, it's a 3,500 pages document, which not only includes step-by-step -step instructions on how to do different things in EAST, um, but it also includes all the theory behind it. So it has extensive appendices, as you can see here, uh, where you can 
actually go in and delve into the details of every one of the methods uh, that is being used, uh, not just for sample size re-estimation, but for some of the other adaptation procedures that we have, or you know, group sequential designs, predict the multi or multi-state stuff that we saw in the first webinar, and so on. So uh, through the extensive appendices of these, you will have, um, in the manual release, uh, you will have a very good feel about what the theory behind it is. The, our next question here, um, would you please show again how I can see the sample size versus study duration plot? The sample size versus study duration, yes. So what you have to do, of course, is you, you would have to run multiple designs, as I have right here. Uh, these designs, you can see the multiplicity is specified in terms of the sample size increase from 1.2 up to 1.8 with a step of 0.1. Uh, so once you select all these designs that you run, you have different options. You can either view all of them side by side, as I showed them to you briefly with the output summary icon, or you can select the uh, oops, you can select the um, oh, I have to select them again. Oh, I did not do that. Once you have them all selected. One of the plots that is available is the study duration and accrual duration plot. And this is what you would get out of it, which will show you for each sample size increase what your study duration is, which is the blue line, and what your accrual duration is, which is the, the yellow line. Thank you. Uh, another question we have here. Is EAST capable of doing sample size re estimation for multiple endpoints, like for progression free survival and overall survival? Uh, currently, it is not. Um, this is one of the, the things that we're working on. There is a list of uh, future improvements uh, that we're making to the software. Um, currently, um, this um, the, the functionality for sample size increase using the promising zone. Uh, is available besides uh, the group sequential designs, two arm designs that I showed you. Uh, they're also available in multi arm studies, uh, when, which is something that we touched upon on the first webinar, when we are using the p value combination methods. Uh, so you have a multiple arm, um, multiple arms compared to control in the first stage. You have your interim look. And then at that interim look, you can graduate the best or the two best treatments along with control into the second stage. And at that point, you can also perform uh, a sample size increase. Uh, so you can perform a sample size increase with multiple arms, not yet with multiple endpoints. Actually, we don't have even group sequential designs with multiple endpoints yet. We're working on that. So uh, I think we have time for just about one more question here. We do have a number of other questions that have come through that we might not get a chance to answer uh, during the webinar today, but we will be sure to uh, follow up with an email with answers to uh, any questions that we're not able to get to. So let's take one last question here. What would the implications if you had non-proportional hazards be? Would you need to be more careful about early decision making? Uh, yes, so this is definitely um, an issue. Um, currently, we have functionality within the software that will enable you to assess what the hit that you're going to be taking in the power is going to be if you have non-proportional hazards. So within the simulation capabilities of the software, you're going to be able, uh, you're still going to be able to add multiple hazard pieces and see what uh, if, for example, you uh, you may have a delayed uh, effect, right? So maybe in, in the first six months, you started very slow. Your hazard ratio has not moved much away from one. Um, after that, you may have a much higher um, uh, drop in the hazard ratio. Uh, that would be an indication of non-proportional uh, hazards. That would have an impact uh, on your power calculation. Um, Currently, you can explore that impact in the context of group sequential designs, um, but there needs to be a lot more 
um, attention need to be paid when you are actually performing a sample size increase of that. Thank you, Pantelis, and, and thank you to everyone for attending today's webinar. Great. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you, everybody, for attending. We'll see you next week for the final uh, webinar on adaptive population enrichment. Thank you all. Have a good day.